look closely at this image. Titled View from the Window at Le Gras, it is widely considered to be the oldest surviving photograph taken almost 200 years ago in 1827 by Joseph Niepce, a French inventor. To create the image, Niepce used a camera obscura to project the view from his second story window onto a chemically treated pewter plate. It was a slow process and the exposure time would have taken around eight hours. Here's the same image, but enhanced and colorized. Perhaps now you can see a bit more. Rooftops of buildings, the top of a tree, the sky above. As is often the case with invention, photography is based on many different ideas going back centuries, but primarily to create a photograph, two inventions were needed. First, the camera obscura, or pinhole camera, which passes light through a tiny hole projecting a reversed image onto a flat surface. Second, some kind of light sensitive material is needed, which would be exposed to the projected image. Camera obscuras had actually been around for centuries, and various materials were known to chemically react to light exposure. So essentially, what Niepce did was bring these two elements together to create a lasting photograph. The word photography is derived from the Greek words photos, meaning light, and graphos, meaning drawing. So the word photography can be thought of as drawing or painting with light, which is exactly what Nieps was doing with his camera upstairs in the window of his house. He was using light to paint an image. While Nieps created the first crude photographs in the 1820s, it would be his associate, Louis Daguerre, who would perfect the photographic process. In 1839, Daguerre introduced the world to his invention, publishing a how-to guide for his daguerreotype process, as he called it. This daguerreotype photograph, titled View from the Boulevard du Temple, was made in 1839 and is already a big leap from the crude images of Niepce. Daguerre's process took minutes rather than hours to expose an image, allowing him to beautifully capture this mostly deserted street in the morning light of Paris. Still, Daguerreotype cameras were big and clunky, and the exposure process took long enough that only still objects could be accurately photographed. This explains why, in many older photographs, people or objects in motion often appear blurry. Before photography, the best way to capture a realistic image of a person was through portrait painting, a laborious and highly expensive process that was reserved for those with wealth and power. But the daguerreotype photograph was much cheaper and faster and, over time, common people could afford to have their likeness captured. Daguerreotypes were an instant commercial success, and they led to a daguerreotype craze as people lined up for portraits outside newly established photography studios. This self-portrait of Daguerre himself was created in 1844. Most daguerreotype photos were small, just a few inches in size, and were kept in decorative frames as keepsakes and family mementos. As time went on, other types of photography were invented, among them tintype, ambrotype, and cabinet cards. To the modern eye, there is something a bit haunting about these early photos, a kind of surrealness. People typically didn't smile in early photographs, because of the longer exposure times, but also the fact that portrait photography took its cue from painting, which required a subject to sit still for many hours. To sit for a photographic portrait was, at the time, a pretty formal affair. In the 1800s, a person might only have a single photo taken of them in their entire life. These photographs were meant to be treasured. They were a way to create permanence. Photography was initially met with a sense of wonder, this seemingly magical technology that could freeze a person in time. This power was, unsurprisingly, exploited, and in the 1850s, photographers experimenting with double exposures were able to create ghost-like images of a person floating above or standing beside a loved one. Customers were told that this new invention, photography, could capture the spirits of the deceased. Of course, it was a scam, 
Photographers would use old photos of loved ones or lookalikes to create the illusion of a spirit appearing through double exposure. Eventually, these spirit photographers were exposed as frauds and run out of town, but the spirit photography scandal was an early example that even the realness of photographs could be manipulated and shaped by those who controlled the process. That Photography was not neutral, not just capturing life as it appears, but a process of creation controlled by people. Early photography was not merely a more accurate or faster form of painting. It was a revolution in the ability to shape and reshape social perceptions and beliefs. And social reformers used cameras as a tool to further their causes. Frederick Douglass, a fierce advocate for the abolition of slavery in the United States, used photography as a means of persuasion. Having escaped enslavement himself, in the 1840s and 50s, Douglass sat for hundreds of photographic portraits, becoming one of the most recognizable Americans of the 19th century. Douglass spread his own image to combat the pervasive racist imagery of African Americans. Celeste Marie Bernier, who wrote a biography of Douglass, explains that for Douglas, photography was the lifeblood of being able to be seen and not caricatured, to be represented and not grotesque, to be seen as fully human and not as an object or chattel to be bought and sold. Common images of black Americans in the 1800s, slave and free alike, were often crude and dehumanizing drawings or paintings. Through photography, Douglas and other abolitionists forced Americans to confront the basic humanity of the enslaved while also seeing the depravity of slavery. Photographs of Douglas and other black activists created the beginning of a new reality where black Americans could be portrayed with dignity and humanity rather than by their racist imaginations of the dominant white society. Douglas loved photography and wrote essays and gave speeches on the topic. In a lecture to a Boston audience in 1861, he remarked, Poets, prophets, and reformers are all picture makers, and this ability is the secret of their power and achievements. They see what ought to be by the reflection of what is, and endeavor to remove the contradiction. The American Civil War fought over slavery between 1861 and 1865 remains the bloodiest conflict in U.S. history, killing well over half a million Americans. And photographers were there to capture the war and its human toll in a starkly realistic manner. Before photography, wars were visually represented through paintings and etchings and other art forms, which typically portrayed heroic leaders or colorful battles, showing warfare as a dramatic, noble effort. Photography, over time, would help deconstruct this romanticized view of war. Through the lens of a camera, Americans saw Civil War battlefields strewn with lifeless bodies, clothes torn and mangled limbs. They saw the drudgery of a soldier's life. These are just some of the thousands of photos taken during the Civil War, the most heavily photographed conflict of the 19th century. This photograph, taken by war photographer Timothy O'Sullivan, is titled Harvest of Death. It was taken in the aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863, the bloodiest battle of the war. Here, there is no romantic notion of battle, but rather the cold costs of war and its deadly consequences. While professional photographers sought to capture dramatic images of conflicts and world events, photography itself became an amateur hobby brought into American homes with the introduction of the Kodak No. 1 camera, developed by George Eastman's Kodak Company in 1888. Kodak put the power of photography in the hands of the everyday person and also made photography affordable, releasing their inexpensive Brownie camera in the year 1900 that only cost $1, which is the equivalent of about $30 today. As Mia Fine, director of photography at the Museum of Modern Art explains, Eastman's real genius lay in his marketing strategy. By simplifying the apparatus and even processing the film for the consumer, he 
He made photography accessible to millions of casual amateurs with no professional training, technical expertise, or aesthetic credentials. To underscore the ease of the Kodak system, Eastman launched an advertising campaign featuring women and children operating the camera and coined the memorable slogan, you press the button, we do the rest. In the early 20th century, photographs published in newspapers and popular magazines would come to reflect a growing and changing nation, helping Americans see their fellow citizens and make sense of a rapidly growing nation, if imperfectly. The Great Depression of the 1930s was the worst period of unemployment and economic misery in the United States, but it was felt unevenly across the country. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt wanted to show all Americans the scale of suffering to inspire support for his New Deal programs, so his administration funded photographers to travel the country and document what they saw. Dorothea Lange was one of these New Deal photographers. She traveled the rural farm country of the West Coast, photographing migrant laborers, displaced farmers, and the destitute who roamed along the roadways looking for worker food. Taken by Lang in 1936, this photograph, titled Migrant Mother, shows a young mother, Florence Thompson, with two of her seven children hungry and out of work and stranded on the side of a road in California. The image would become one of the most famous images of the 20th century. The work of Lang and other New Deal photographers captured the desperation and lack of hope that millions felt, giving the depression a human face. And their photographs helped FDR pass his New Deal government programs that would help alleviate suffering and bring the country out of the crisis. During World War II, Photography helped Americans make sense of the sprawling conflict and provided a sense of unity through showcasing the war effort at home and abroad. Perhaps the best known photo of the conflict is raising the flag on Iwo Jima, which captured a moment of hope and persistence amid the fierce fighting in the Pacific theater. Shot by AP photographer Joel Rosenthal, the image was published throughout the country and was immediately used to help promote the war effort. It has become an iconic image of patriotism and sacrifice during one of America's most trying times. Of the six U.S. Marines in the photograph, three were killed before the battle for Iwo Jima was over. Sergeant Michael Strank, Corporal Harlan Block, and Private First Class Franklin Susley. With large numbers of men off to war, many women took their place in U.S. factories, building planes, tanks, and other industrial goods. Photographs of women doing so-called men's work were published in popular magazines like Life and were not easily forgotten. Many of the young women who saw these images in the 1940s would, in the decades following, help lead a revolution in gender roles and push for equality of opportunity as part of the women's liberation movement. As the war came to an end, photographs were published from liberated concentration camps and the world began to learn about the systematic mass murder of over 6 million Jewish people and other so-called undesirables by Nazi Germany. However difficult they are to look at, these images of the Holocaust have provided a powerful account of how ultranationalism and dictatorship could lead to unspeakable suffering and violence, and are shown in schools and in history books throughout the country as a cautionary tale. One of the unique powers of photography is its ability to distill large social issues into a human moment. During the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s, dramatic photos of racism and police brutality against African Americans helped turn public opinion against racist Jim Crow policies of the American South. One of the most famous images of the era shows an angry mob screaming and kicking at 15-year-old Elizabeth Eckford, one of the Little Rock Nine, the first group of black students to attend a newly desegregated high school in Arkansas in 1957. The image draws on a universally felt experience, a nervous teen on her first day at a new school, yet with unimaginably high stakes. That a teenage girl just trying to go to school would be subject to such vicious hatred and violence was difficult for people to witness, including many white Americans. In this way, 
Photography expands people's perception beyond their own neighborhoods and social groups, and can be used as a tool to document the experience of a group of people unseen by society at large, such as a community experiencing police brutality or racism. For many white Americans, it was easy to be unaware and equally so complicit in the racist attitudes and oppressive policies of the era. But photography would help confront Americans of all races with the pervasive evil of racism and bigotry. In the mid 20th century, magazines were a popular form of news and entertainment, and none more so than Life Magazine, America's first all photographic news magazine. Published weekly starting in 1932, Life was a pioneer in visual storytelling, featuring photo essays on cultural trends, new technologies, celebrities, and news stories. It's estimated that at the height of its popularity, Life magazine reached roughly 25% of the country, an unimaginable feat for a magazine or any media outlet today. Life's editorial perspective did reflect their largely white, middle-class audience. It didn't shy away from the major issues of the day, like civil rights or women's liberation, but as a corporation, what they covered and how they covered it was shaped by the need to sell copies and appease advertisers. Readers were much more likely to see a story about celebrities or fashion as they were to see critical perspectives of the status quo. But Life did cover cultural changes, and in 1964, Life was the first national magazine to run a major story on what was a severe social taboo, gay men. Titled Homosexuality in America, Life ran a 14-page long photo essay that reported on the growing visibility of gay men in major American cities. The article did use expected stereotypes of the era, portraying gay men as lonely, estranged, and suffering, and living secretive double lives. Yet, despite its pathologizing tone, the article is gently critical of the constant police arrests and employment discrimination that many gay people faced. Life portrays gay people as a real and existing group, one that, at the very least, deserved attention, perhaps even understanding. For the country, Life magazine was a kind of television before television, what Americans looked to to learn about themselves, a weekly roundup of American culture. Unsurprisingly, as television came to dominate in the late 1950s and 1960s, Life circulation declined until it ceased weekly publication in 1972. Time magazine, which started in 1923, focused more exclusively on news and current events, with photojournalism at its center. Time magazine covers, which used a single large photographic image, came to symbolize the events, themes, and people that were in the news. Special features, like their Person of the Year cover, became a symbolically powerful way to designate someone as globally important or influential. To this day, Time magazine covers are used as a visual historical shorthand for newsworthy events in a given time, a kind of national collective memory. National Geographic, a large format glossy magazine founded in 1888, published photographs of the natural world and different human cultures. One of the most widely subscribed to photographic magazines of all time, National Geographic sought to represent the grand diversity of the world in an unprecedented manner. Their stunning photographs transporting readers across time and space, from archaeological digs to lush jungles to high up on mountaintops. While National Geographic photographers sought to document the world, they carried with them the biases and assumptions of a largely Western perspective. The magazine was founded by the National Geographic Society, an elite club of scientists, government officials, and businessmen. Especially in its early decades, National Geographic looked at the world through a lens of racial and cultural hierarchy, portraying different cultures as civilized or uncivilized, often framing the groups of people it documented as backwards, exotic, or unintelligent. For example, in a 1918 article, indigenous Aboriginal Australians were referred to as savages who, quote, rank lowest in intelligence among all human beings. A century later, in 2018, Susan Goldberg, editor-in-chief of National Geographic, issued a public apology for the magazine's past practices, which she acknowledged were, at times, explicitly racist. 
Goldberg explained that the magazine covered native peoples as, quote, exotics, famously and frequently unclothed, happy hunters, noble savages, every type of cliché. Documentary photographers, like those at National Geographic, choose what to capture and what to ignore. They choose how to frame their subjects, which elements to highlight, which stories to construct through the visual image. Photos are then edited, captioned, and narrativized into articles. Photographers on assignment take hundreds or even thousands of photographs. So the selection of a few images to publish is an act that constructs a particular meaning or set of meanings. These decisions are made, consciously or not, to fit pre-existing narratives and to fill the expectations of, in the case of National Geographic, their affluent Western readership. In this way, the relationship between the subject and a photographer involves a fundamental power dynamic, when one person or group controls how another is captured and represented. At its core, photography is a way of extending our vision and perspective well beyond the limits of our eyes. As the camera lens expands our horizons, so too can it transform our sense of place in the world. Consider this photograph taken in 1968 by astronaut Bill Anders during the Apollo 8 space mission. It's a profound image. Called Earthrise, it captured the first time humanity could perceive itself all together as a single living entity. Seen from the vantage point of the moon, Earth looks small and alone. The photograph gave people a new kind of consciousness that the Earth is a single home that we all share, no matter our differences. Five years later, in 1972, a second, stunningly detailed photo of Earth was taken during the final manned mission to the moon, Apollo 17. The image is titled, Blue Marble. These two photographs have often been credited with helping inspire the modern environmental movement that arose in the early 1970s. And there were a string of major initiatives and laws that were passed within just a few years of the publication of Earthrise. The Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Endangered Species Act. Years later, in 1990, the space probe Voyager 1 snapped this photograph at a record distance of 6 billion kilometers away from Earth. Titled Pale Blue Dot, Earth appears as a tiny speck amid the dust of the universe. From this distant vantage point, the Earth might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, Thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines. Every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization. Every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, Every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. <laughs>